Last time we were working on uh, infinite series, so we got to look at telescoping series and the geometric series. So that's two out of the ten tests that we're going to learn about infinite series to determine whether a series converges or diverges. Well, so last time we looked at the geometric series. That's one of the one of the special series for which we can actually compute the value of the infinite sum along with the telescoping series. For the remaining tests that we are going to look, if that's not going to be the case, so we're just going to use those tests to determine whether a series converges or diverges. Well, so we'll look at a couple of examples. Last time, one that converges, one that diverges, and a special piece of information here is that our series, for the geometric series, has to start at n equals to zero. If for some reason your series doesn't start at zero, well, we have to do the process, a process called shifting of the uh, shifting indices, right? So, and well, here is the description of what we do about the shifting of the index. So for example, if we subtract a number in the starting index, we need to do the opposite in the general rule, that is add that same number. For example, let us see, we have sigma n equals 3 to infinity of 9 times 3 7 to the n power. Well, by looking at this series, it, it already looks like a r to the n power, so it seems like we can just go ahead and compute the value of the series well. But the problem here is that n is not starting at zero now. It, it is, this is worth uh, making the shift of the index because if we observe the value of r, which is 3 sevenths, that's a number less than 1, which indicates that the series will converge, but otherwise, if for some reason, you see a value larger than or equal to one, well then it's not worth the shifting of the index because that's going to be a divergent series, so why bother and do all this shifting of the index, all right? In this case, yes. So this is what we're going to do. Uh, subtract three to turn that starting index into a zero, but if we subtract three in the starting index, then we have to do the opposite in the general rule, which is add three. All right, and that becomes n equal in sigma n equals zero to infinity. Well, we are essentially subtracting three to the upper limit, but I mean infinity minus three always remains infinity, you know. But uh, that's why I really don't do that operation there. So that's going to be nine times three over seven to the n times three over seven cubed. So we need to simplify this madness here uh, in order to get it in the order that we decide, in the form that we desire. 3 over 7 to the n, that's uh, 27 over 343, all right? And then multiply, um, <clears throat> multiply 27 times 9. Uh, that's uh, 243, 243 over 343, 3 over 7 to the n power. And yes, this is this series, it's still in the form a r to the n power, but now we have a series with a starting index at n equals to zero. So, and well, we identify the value of a. That's uh, a equals to 243 over 343 and r equals to 3 over 7. Well, 3 over 7, it's a value less than 1, so this will constitute um, co a convergent geometric series. So for this reason, we can find the infinite sum, a over 1 minus r, where a is this 243 over 343 divided by 1 minus r, which is 3 over 7. Okay, so 1 minus 3 over 7, that's essentially the same as saying 7 over 7 minus 3 over 7, which is 4 over 7. Now, careful.
careful with this kind of quotient because this is fraction over a fraction. Dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. Well, so essentially we leave the first fraction the way it is, 243, over 343 times 7 over 4. And let's try and simplify this to lowest terms. Well, we got that 343 came from cubing the 7. So if we, if we divide out 7 and 343, that's 1 and 49. And so we're going to be left with the following number. 243 times 1, that's a 243. And 49 times 4, 196, right? And that's the value of the infinite sum. All right, and again, this finding the infinite, finding computing the value of the infinite sum, only, only, it's only possible for the geometric series, of course, in the convergence case, and the telescoping series, right? So, let's see. The next is about properties of infinite series. So, this is what we're going to do, like operations with series, you know, like having a series being multiplied by a constant. So what is that multiplication by a constant going to do? Well, multiply the value of the infinite sum times c, for example, times 5, times 4, times 7, times negative 13, you know your favorite number. And when we have two series, a and b, we can add or subtract those values of, two, of those two series. But, the, but here the hypothesis is that both a and b will give a convergent series, you know, because, well, uh, how can you add or subtract uh, something that diverges with something that converges? That doesn't really make sense. And, and even if you run into that situation, well, we have the remark here that um, if one of the two series that we are adding or subtracting, well, depending on the order, depending on the operation, if at least one diverges, well, then the whole series diverges because Okay, one series diverges, let's say it diverges, it diverges to 3, that's the infinite sum. But then the other series diverges to infinity, what is 3 plus infinity? Isn't that still infinity? So overall we have a divergent series, because everything is blowing up to infinity. That adding a plus 3 or even subtracting a 3, that's not going to do any harm to the infinity, it still remains infinite. All right. So let's look at an example to illustrate, a couple of examples actually, to illustrate this property. Well, so sigma n equals 1 to infinity. So notice we have 2, to, 2 times 3 to the n minus 2 to the n over 5 to the n. Well, notice this, the negative sign in the numerator. That means we can go about splitting this into two terms. All right, that is 2 times 3 to the n over 5 to the n minus sigma n equals 1 to infinity 2 to the n over 5 to the n. Well, 3 to the n over 5 to the n is the same as saying the quotient 3 fifths to the n power and same for the second term. 2, uh, 2 to the n over 5 to the n is the same as saying 2 to 2 fifths to the n power. All right, so far, so good. So far, things are working nicely. All right, so that's 2 times 3 fifths to the n minus 2, <clears throat> two fifths to the n. And wh what do I mean by everything is working well so far? Because look at the common ratios, look at the values of R. <coughs> Three-fifths, both three-fifths and two-fifths are individually less than one. So that means these two series are going to give both convergent series. So we can go ahead and find the infinite sums. However, are these two series ready to be fun, to, ready to compute their infinite sums or do we have to do anything? Subtract the two out. All right, subtract the two out. Which one? Well, the first one. This one? Yeah. Well, that's going to be part of the A when... So cool. Yes. Uh, exactly, right? So the starting, the starting indices right here have to be zero for both. And well, we know the shifting index theorem. Subtract one, add one. Subtract one to turn into zero, add one to 
to even out with the process, right? Well, so that sigma n equals 0 to infinity, 2 times 3 fifths to the n times 3 fifths minus sigma n equals 0 to infinity, uh, that's uh, 2 fifths to the n times 2 fifths. Well, we have the second series pretty much ready to go, except how about, well, let's multiply 2 times 3 over 5, which is 6 over 5, 3 over 5 to the n, minus sigma n equals 0 to infinity, let's have the 2 fifths in the front, 2 fifths to the n. So what do we have now? We, we have the two series, a r to the n, a r to the n, and both series now starting at n equals to zero, that means we're good to go and go about the, in, the computing their infinite sums. However, you may not want to do all these calculations in the same line. So, in this case, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to label this as S1, and I'm going to label this as S2. What I'm going to do is I'm going to compute these sums separately, and then just put together the results. Okay. So, S, S1, that's uh, A over 1, oh, that looks like a 9, 1 minus R, so that's A, which is 6 over 5, 1 minus 3 fifths. So that's uh, 6 over 5 over, well, that's essentially 5 over 5 minus 3 over 5. Isn't that a 2 over 5? And we can divide out the 5s. That's going to leave us with 6 over 2, which is 3. And the second sum, again, a 1 minus r. So this a, which in this case is 2 over 5, divide that by uh, 1 minus 2 over 5. So that's going to be 2 over 5, divided by 1 minus 2 over 5, but that's again 5 over 5 minus 2 over 5, isn't it? 3 over 5? Yes, uh, 2 over 5. And we can cancel out these 5s again, leaving us with 2 thirds. All right. So we can go back to the original computation of the infinite sums. That will be 3 minus 2 thirds. Well, to simplify this, that's 3 times 3, which is 9. 9 minus 2? 7. 7 over 3. And that's our final answer. All right. In this case, we were computing two sums at the same time. All right. Let's look what happens for the next exercise. Sigma n equals 1 to infinity of 9 times 4 to the n power minus 7 to the n over 5 to the n. So we're going to split it into two series in a similar way that we did with the previous example. So that's going to be sigma n equals 1 to infinity, 9, 4 to the n over 5 to the n minus sigma n equals 1 to infinity, uh, 7 to the n over 5 to the n. All right, let's write it again as the form a r to the n, that is combine or, or rewrite the quotients 4 to the n, 5 to the n, and 7 to the n over 5 to the n as, as one single quotient or as a quotient raised to a single power. So this is sigma n equals 1 to infinity of 9 times 4 fifths to the n power, well, if we observe the value of r here, well, this is a number less than 1, so we can go ahead and shift the index to compute the value of the infinite sum. However, check the second series. For the second series, when we write it in the form, a r to the n, uh, that's a 7 over 5 to the n power, but the problem here is that 7 fifths, it's a number greater than or equal to 1, and in accordance with the geometric series test, this is a divergent infinite series, right? So, whatever the value of this series, which is, I mean, 5, 7, or whatever fraction, minus infinity, 
Isn't that going to be negative infinity? So the whole series right here diverges. So no need to shift the indices. It's not going to be worth the effort because we know for sure that by looking at one of the, uh, the values of R, that, that's the value of R that constitutes our divergent series. So the whole thing diverges. All right. <clears throat> All right. I think this is, oh, there's more. There's more. So the next section, the next topic is the third technique that we're going to learn to determine divergence to, or to test a series for convergence divergence. However, be careful because the end term test for divergence, it's only used to determine divergence, not convergence, all right? So here is what, this, what the test tells us. Well, number one, if the limit <laughs> So what we're going to do is take the limit of the expression inside of the summation sign. So if the limit of that expression is, is zero, or DNE, and by DNE, in the, and that DNE also includes infinity, all right, DNE or infinity, plus or minus infinity actually, right? Not just infinity. <coughs> So let's include both, plus or minus infinity. Well, then we say that it diverges, all right? So, it diverges. However, if the limit equals to zero, then our test is inconclusive. And then we'll have to go about a different technique to find to determine, or rather, to determine the convergence or the divergence of the series. All right, so we need to we need to look at something else. All right, so let's have a look at some examples. Sigma n equals one to infinity, up uh, to n squared plus one over three n squared minus one. So write this as a limit problem. Oh, that's all we have to do. Approach infinity to n squared plus one over 3n squared to minus 1 and compute the limit and again at this point you're good to go and compute the, li compute the limit the, the, the easier way of course I mean the, the calc 1 way to compute this limit is to divide every single term by the highest power in the denominator divide out the terms and then see what are the terms that survive the cancellation that that's going to take a good minute to do the other way is to go with the shortcuts that you connect with the pre-calculus idea of finding the horizontal asymptote which is ultimately what a li what, a, what limits at infinity are horizontal asymptotes and in this case degrees match just go with the ratio of the leading coefficient. So the limit here is two thirds, but because this limit is a number that is not equal to zero, well, diverges. All right, that's it. Let's look at another example. limit e to the n square as n approaches infinity what is this limit equal to, equal to infinity. infinity because well infinity square whoa that's going to be even more infinity and then raise e to that already big infinity is going to get a bigger infinity infinity which is not equal to zero all right it's not equal to zero that means diverges so this test is only to check for divergence, nothing else, all right? This test is not going to be used to find the limit, I mean to find convergence. Example, letter C, limit one over five n squared plus three as n approaches infinity. What's this limit equal to? Zero. Zero. All right. What is that going to tell us in accordance with the end term test for divergence? Divergence unknown. Mm. <laughs> test inconclusive. 
all right test inconclusive so we would need to find a different a different test for this series we can use the integral test which is what we're going to learn next we can use maybe a limit comparison test or direct comparison test which is something we're going to learn next week but uh but but initially find the limit you get zero well it's inconclusive so let's go about something else all right The integral test and well essentially that's to connect a series we're going to connect a series with a cor with the corresponding function f of x and we're going to draw conclusions about the series based on what we get from computing the value of an, of an improper integral all right and well you might remember from improper integrals that if we get a finite value, whether this is an integer, a rational, an irrational, decimal, anything, that integral converges and that's the value, uh, that the value of the area under the curve. However, uh, we're going to use that information about the improper integral to determine whether the series converges or diverges. So, if the integral converges, well, the series converges. If the integral diverges, then the series diverges. All right? But the thing here is we need to be very careful because the value of the integral is the, is the value of the area under the curve. However, that doesn't have any to do, anything to do with the value of the infinite series. Recall that the only, con the only uh, techniques to find values of infinite series for now are the geometric series and the telescoping series, nothing else. So, so need to be very careful with this. Another thing to be very careful of, uh, we cannot just use the integral test by just looking at the series. Oh, that looks like an integrable function. I can do a use of, I can do partial fractions, I can do a trick of, no, we cannot use it just right away. There's three conditions that have to be satisfied for a series to be to qualify for the integral test. Number one, the related function has to be continuous. It has to be positive. It has to be a series of positive terms. And finally, it has to be a decreasing function. If it's not a dec if one of these three conditions fails to be satisfied, we cannot use the three, uh, the integral test. Well, you can use it, you can get the value, however, it's not going to be a valid test. All right? So, let's go ahead and look at some examples. <clears throat> so, use the integral test to determine whether the given series converge or diverge. So, we have a series, n equals 1 to infinity, 1 over n squared. Number one, let's write down the corresponding function f of x to which we will relate that's 1 over x squared all right and let's analyze the three conditions letter a is the function continuous okay be careful because okay yeah look at that function that function is discontinuous at x equals to zero all right however we're interested only in the interval from 1 to infinity, and that interval does not contain the discontinuity, right? So in this case, we're good to go. It's continuous. So far, the first condition has, is satisfied. Letter B, uh, decreasing. No, wait, not decreasing, a positive. And it is, right? You don't have to do anything about it. I mean, just uh, expand some of the terms in your head. I mean, we're plugging in positive values of n, the first term, the second term, the third term, etc. And well, one over a positive number squared, that's gonna give us a positive. So yes, it's a, posi it's, it's a positive series. Now, decreasing. And here is where it's going to get a little tricky. Well, 
by just looking at the function <coughs> well it, it looks like a decreasing function if you plug in some values you're gonna you're gonna get values that are smaller every time however n values in this case does not constitute a proof in a way that this is continuous so we need to do it in a universal way that with a, with a, with a, with a universal argument that tells about every single value of x so for this we're going to use calculus all right so what do we have f of x equals 1 over x squared which is f of x equals x to the negative 2 find the derivative that's negative 2 x to the negative 3 which is negative 2 over x cubed and in this case this is for values x greater than or equal to 1 because that's the condition in our infinite series. We're only interested in that interval. How does that argument actually prove that the, the function is decreasing well? Okay, again, uh, the geometric definition of the derivative, what's that? It's the slope of the tangent line at a given point, all right? Well, what does that, what does it tell us when the slope is negative or when the derivative is negative? So all slopes are negative or that means a function is going down the hill or decreasing, right? And in this case, notice we're showing this for all values of x greater than or equal to 1 in, as opposed to plugging in values and say, oh, they're getting smaller. They're getting, no, that's not the correct. So we have to take the derivative and show it via calculus all right we're good to go because the three conditions check they're sa it's satisfied let's go ahead and write this as an integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x squared with respect x but again we don't we don't treat in improper integrals this way we have to treat them like a limit problem because again doing f of b minus f of a is technically not correct when one of the limits is infinity because doing arithmetic with infinity mm, that's kind of weird all right so limit and uh, b approaches infinity that's a one from one to b x to the negative two with respect x so uh, i moved that to the numerator so we can integrate it and general power rule so that's a uh, limit b approaches infinity uh, that's a negative x to the negative 1 or rather x to the negative 1 over negative 1 from 1 to b and I'm going to take this negative out of the limit and that's going to be 1 over x from 1 to b and well negative limit 1 over b minus 1 over 1 as b approaches infinity and let's compute this limit where is this term going to go to and 1 over 1 is simply 1 so that's going to be negative 0 minus 1 that's positive 1 so what do we have here number one we have that the integral converges well the integral converges to 1 that's the area under the curve in this case but we don't care about that so we're just using this conclusion to conclude about the series so therefore the series also diverges oh wait wait, wait no converges doesn't converge to this value all right just converges that's it all right in fact I believe this is equal to pi squared over 6 I know it's weird uh, you would need higher levels of mathematics to find to compute infinite sums I know I mean you're adding rational numbers 1 over 1 squared that's 1 1 over 2 squared that's 1 4 1 over 8, 1 over etc. I oh, know, wait, 1 over 3, 1 over 9. And how do you get this weird irrational? So you'll see that when you get to Fourier analysis, those of you that are 
engineering majors in, uh, in electrical circuits and uh, uh, structural analysis in mechanical engineering you use a lot of Fourier analysis and complex analysis and you will use a lot of clever clever tricks to add to find these infinite sums all right let's look at another value right here so and another value another series sigma n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n let's write down the corresponding function f of x equals 1 over x all right and let's determine whether letter a is continuous and it's continuous the same the same argument as before the only difference this time is as opposed to 1 over x squared this is just 1 over x so yes it's continuous B. Uh, positive? Yes. Yes. And decreasing? Yes. All right, let's find out. It looks like, but we need to f of x equals x to the negative 1. Take the derivative, and if the derivative is negative, means decreasing. If the derivative is positive, well, then it's increasing. And, well, one of the conditions will fail to satisfy the decreasing condition, so we cannot use the integral test. So that's uh, negative x to the negative 2, which is negative 1 over x squared for x greater than or equal to 1. Well, for values of x greater than or equal to 1, you will always get negative values of the derivative, which actually this shows that it is decreasing indeed. All right? Okay, so let's go about writing an improper integral. So that's going to be the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x dx. Let's write it as a limit problem. And 1 over x dx. And well, what's the integral of 1 over x? Natural log. Natural log. Absolute value of x from 1 to b. And limit ln of b minus ln of 1. All right. B approaches infinity and well ln of 1 is 0 but what's ln of B for B really big infinity. infinity so what's infinity minus 0 it's infinity. that's infinity mm -hmm. so that equals infinity and well this tells us that the integral diverges and so the series diverges also all right okay so